We all know that North Myrtle Beach is the place to be if you want to experience our state dance, Shag. And we all know that before 1968, the name North Myrtle Beach didn't even exist. But here are some facts I bet you didn't know. When I first started working at the post office, I would go twice a day when the mails would, would come in in the morning and in the afternoon and help put up the mail and if everybody was there, sell stamps or whatever. And as I said, it was just a little hole in the wall. But I guess it, it must have taken two of us to put up the mail because uh, it was the meeting place for the whole community of Windy Hill and, and surrounding areas. And, uh, but I, I can remember how hot it was. We had no air conditioning, there was no outside window. And it, in the back of the, the market, they had uh, a storage room where they had ice, blocks of ice to keep foods cold. And we'd take turns running out there and, and, and getting cooled off, sitting on a, a block of ice. And, but uh, the, uh, I remember one time I was at the window selling stamps and I ran into a, a young lady that I had gone to college with in Ohio at Western College for Women. And I said, I found out then what a small world we live in that uh, somebody could show up at that little tiny window in a little tiny post office in a little tiny, not even a town at that time. And so all of our lives have been spent uh, enjoying whatever comes tomorrow uh, or today uh, makes your life worthwhile. I put in my application to teach school in Myrtle Beach, and I was accepted, but I, I had to, of course, pass a uh, teacher's exam, which I passed, and uh, then I started teaching. And the, I remember Harry Spann was the uh, head of the schools, and he came to me, he said, Don, he said, you're certified to teach high school English and math. He said, but we, we really have that filled, but we do have an opening for seventh and eighth grade, which is junior high uh, for uh, English and math. I said, oh, that's all right, because I never taught before anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I started teaching the seventh and eighth grade kids. Well, I got ready. I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, so I started out at $200 a month for nine months. And, but in the meantime, I had purchased, I had borrowed money from relatives and purchased oceanfront property, uh, a large uh, two-story house with two apartments and a garage apartment behind it. I purchased that property and of course I rented that in the uh, summertime. And so I was teaching school in the winter and the summer I went to work for Byers Realty Company and, uh, and, we, and rented the apartments. Well, naturally I kept my apartments full so I had no problem. And uh, that was a good life until 1954 when Hazel came along. And then I was wiped out. And when I came to North Myrtle Beach in 1978, like I told you, I was working for the city of North Myrtle Beach. Um, I, those days just always stick in my heart. We were, we were like one big family that worked together. Like I told you, um, if there was a hurricane, everyone worked. No one went home. Um, after the hurricane, everybody was made sure that you you were okay, your house was taken care of, you had electricity or whatever. If not, everybody made arrangements for somebody to be somewhere. But I'm going to tell you a story that a lot of people don't know. Um, 
Charles had a, a dispatcher who, who had cancer. And she was, uh, she was very well liked in the city and you know, a big part of the family. She's very brave and she worked as long as she could. This, the employees wanted to do what we could to make sure that she was not without funds. So I'm, I never quite figured out how her insurance carried over, but I'm sure that someone worked that out. But people started giving up their vacation. And uh, they would call into City Hall and they would give a week's vacation, or they would give two weeks vacation. And they would give it toward her so that, um, and her name was Peggy, I guess it's okay to say that, but they would give it um, toward her. And to the day she passed away, she never went a week without a paycheck. And I, that just always stuck out in my mind that people would give away their, their personal time. I would, I mean, everybody knew her, but they weren't responsible for her. But they became responsible for her because they wanted to. Um, and there again, that was under the days of, um, you know, Mr. Floyd being mayor. I was in my restaurant seven days a week 14, 15 hours a day. There wasn't too much time for anything else. And that's just the way I spent my time, except, you know, in the wintertime we'd close, you know. But uh, way back then they had, a, after Labor Day, you, it, just about all the restaurants closed. Everything on the beach, especially, not, not, not the Highway 17, but uh, we'd close and then open back up in April. We'd have us a nice little vacation. But uh, of course things have changed. And, I think one of the biggest changes that I saw was having the roads, having better roads, building this intercoastal waterway bridge, and the real estate companies changing their time, their days from it's uh, alternating Saturdays and Sundays for uh, the rental check in and out. Because back then, when they just had the old swing bridge, I've known it to be traffic backed up almost all the way to Loris, the cars coming and the going. And so they finally made a change where they alternated. They have it Saturday and Sunday for, you know, check in and check outs. So that, that really helped a whole lot. In the 80s, um, he was called by Pegram Architects in Myrtle Beach and asked to consult uh, with them on a project that they were working on with Calvin Gilmore uh, had decided he had a theater in Surfside and Calvin had decided he wanted a theater that had what they call clear span, no columns so that in the audience so that there would be a lot better view um, you know of the stage and uh, but they didn't want the look of the pre-engineered building so Gerald worked with um, Pegram Architects and Dargan Construction and he really came up with a concept of reversing the panels on the outside and putting on ephos or and then covering it with stucco so it looks like a, you know a conventional building but has the functionality of um, you know a metal building. Our first first building was Carolina Opry and Dixie Stampede. We did the two of them uh, simultaneously almost and it was quite a an anxious time for us because uh, one company bought our company out that we were buying our buildings from after we'd already submitted the bids and everything for this but the second company agreed you know that they would supply us with the steel they would have it their own time at the same price and everything you know that that we had agreed to um, in our contracts and I can remember it was the week of Christmas we had uh, 32 trucks to roll into the area. Huge long trucks coming in from uh, the Texas plant, the Alabama plant, the Georgia plant with all the steel and uh, it was it was something like I had never seen before. We had had larger jobs and you know I would once in a while go out and watch them unload it because it was quite a you know an exciting process to see all that steel come in, all the panels and and everything and then go back and watch the guys you know, put it all together. But those two buildings were on the ground before January the 1st, which is what they had promised us. And we started construction right after that of, of erecting those two buildings. And then Dargan did 
the facades and the, the front, but the metal buildings were all were all done, you know, by us. And um, then we did uh, Gatlin Brothers Theater out in uh, Fantasy Harbor, and then Alabama Theater. And I, I've always kidded about the fact that I stand, I stood on the stage at Alabama and sang before Alabama did, you know. Now there's one time when David come through in 1960, I was scared. And I wasn't scared until then. But it, it came through, and I was living in a trailer at the time, and it, we didn't have any current, so we went to bed. It was about 8 o'clock, and there was no lights, no nothing, so we just went to bed. We didn't, we didn't uh, stay up late, no, we didn't have no television. And that wind turned that trailer upon two wheels till I almost rolled out of bed, and then it set back down. That's when I come out of that trailer. <laughs> And I, run, I went over there in front of my daddy's grocery store to get out of the wind, you know. It was, uh, David had already passed and we were getting the back wind from it. And uh, we stayed there until it calmed back down two, three hours for daylight, right? And uh, from that time, it must have been 40 years. They could mention a hurricane out there and my heart would just beat up, and I'd be nervous until it, until it passed Cape Patrick. I couldn't help it. But uh, I didn't know the Lord as well then as I do now. Back during the uh, days of our, our togger shop days, uh, we had a building there which uh, we eventually bought from Mr. Thompson in 1969. He said, uh, Harry, I think you can buy this building uh, as about as uh, cheap as you can rent it from me. And I said, well, let's get together. So I was in service and uh, I was entitled to get an SBA loan, which I did and bought it. But about the building, uh, of course, on one side was the ladies shop and on the uh, right side was the men's shop. In the middle of this building, center of the building, was a hallway that went all the way back to the back, which was a bowling alley and Mr. Thompson ran the bowling alley. Only bowling alley down here, I think, at the time. But anyway, uh, he uh, had uh, Reverend, this Reverend up in Little River Neck had about seven little black boys, and they were all pen setters. They set up pens. Back then, we didn't have uh, automatic <laughs> pen setters. So they set up the pens for Mr. Thompson. Well. Sometimes these little guys would uh, get into a little argument back there, and maybe throw some pins at each other. So Mr. Thompson, had a, he, about all he could take of this. So what he did, he closed the, closed the bowling alley, got all the little boys in the car, took them home. And the Reverend, their father, took care of everything else. So the next <laughs> day they came back, they were ready to set up pins. Had no more problems. <laughs> we would go to Cherry Grove Inlet, when we were growing up and go crabbing and flounder gigging. And when you go flounder gigging, you take a pitchfork. And if you see one, you gig it. <laughs> Basically, you, you get it, you know. We would go to the fish market, Eugene's, and he would give us fish heads. And we'd always have a, a bucket. We'd put those fish heads in, in the bucket in some water have some string, run the string through the gill of the fish head, and just throw them in the water. Well, there would just be oodles of crabs coming, and then you'd pull them in. But if you saw a flounder underneath the sand and it would move, you could take the pitchfork and gig it. We did that a lot, a lot growing up in the summertime. There wasn't anybody up there very, very few houses. It was just open. You could go. I remember maybe once or twice going over to Hog Inlet. Very few times because you had to watch when the tide came in and it got very, very deep. We were not allowed to do that very often. I know early in the morning I just screamed and begged for my father to take me with him, you know, and he did. I, of course, maybe that wasn't wise during the time, but the storm had passed, essentially, and we'd gotten word of that, and that it was 
modestly safe to go back in where your properties were. So we drove a car and it was absolutely, un it was surreal. Uh, I mean, it was like uh, anti-Pleasantville. You know, it, it was houses, I mean, entire old frame beach houses virtually turned upside on their roof. I mean, upside down. I remember there was a house next to our beach house that we lost completely and lost all kinds of, uh, I guess, mementos and memorabilia and keepsakes and irreplaceables. You know, we lost all this stuff in this garage <coughs> where we had our belongings stored and lost our oceanfront house. And, of course, nobody had really had any quote, insurance back then. Uh, th these were kind of new, new things. And, but fortunately, uh, a year or so later, my father was able to borrow money from the federal government very inexpensively, and they made that available for people to restore their, their livelihood and, and their properties. But I recall, as a little kid, you know, six or seven years old, going in these old torn apart houses with no power and no water and nothing, and seeing chairs up in trees, what trees were left, and uh, this great big house that was two houses down from us, and I can see it when I close my eyes, had these old big awnings on it, you know, and the floor was made of old heart pine, and the floor, the house was all crushed, but we climbed up in the house, somehow it was dangerous as it was, but little kids were venturous, and we climbed up, and, and the floor was like a roller coaster. And we would get on these uh, pieces of cloth or, or something and, and slide down this old, this floor of this destroyed house, you know. So as you can see, we're hard at work documenting history for the future North Myrtle Beach Area Historical Museum. And here's one more fact, we need you. Come join us in our effort to preserve North Myrtle Beach Area history.